Erin Kennedy here today with Evan New, and we're doing Tech Teardown. First, our headlines. Yesterday, Carl Icahn tweeted that he had dinner with Tim Cook and made the case for a $150 billion buyback of Apple shares, adding that the discussion would continue in three weeks. That would be an enormous increase in Apple buybacks. Do you agree with Icon here? I think that Apple certainly has the cash to do so, and you know, obviously, they would continue to do the same uh, strategy of using debt to uh, raise f domestic cash to buy back the shares uh, as a roundabout way to tap their foreign reserves. But 150 billion dollar buyback would be a very nice catalyst for investors because that's significantly bigger than the existing program. They increased the existing program to about 60 billion earlier this year, and so far through the end of June, they had bought back about 18. Uh, their fiscal year just closed, but we won't know how much they bought back in the most recent quarter until they release earnings in a couple weeks. But this could easily be uh, upwards of four times what's remaining, and 150 billion dollars is the size of Amazon. So I think it's, it could be a pretty big move. So I can went on uh, CNBC acknowledging that he can't guarantee that Apple will go through with this implementation, but he said he's not going to go away until they hear a lot more from him. Icahn's known to be an activist investor, but how can you be an activist investor with a company that has a market cap of nearly $450 billion? So that's, that, that kind of takes one of his usual strategies off the table, which is you know go in there, get a 10% stake, and, and really start shaking things up by getting some board seats, you know, things like that. But yeah, like you said, this company is so big that a 10% stake is a $45 billion position, and Icon says right now he's got about a $2 billion position, so that's a, it's a pretty big increase, and especially for an investor that's uh, not really big into tech stocks. Now, the, the alternative is he could wage a proxy battle and really rally other shareholders behind him so he can still get their votes if he can you know, get them on his side without having to actually have their shares. But he did specifically say he's not interested in threatening Apple. He, he likes what they're doing. He likes Tim Cook. He thinks Tim Cook's doing a good job. He is not really wanting to go in there and shake up the strategy. He just wants to give recommendations on the financial aspect of you know, Apple's capital structure, things of that sort that he does have a lot of knowledge about. So is Icon an actual concern for investors right now? I think he's a, you know, most of the time Icon has a very positive impact on stocks because you know, he usually goes in there and improves things. You know, and again, this is usually things from the corporate level, financial structure. You know, sometimes that might you know, come into strategic uh, aspects, but Icon is definitely a, a good guy to have on your side if you're an investor. Let's move on to our next headline. AT&T is going on the offensive in Texas. Earlier this year, Google announced that it would be like adding Austin, Texas to its lineup of Google Fiber Cities, which would bring gigabit internet speeds to Austin. AT&T has now deployed its Fiber Octave network in August and will begin service in December. Should Google be concerned that AT&T beat it to the punch? This is a bittersweet topic for me since I just moved out of Austin away from Google Fiber that everyone wants. But uh, literally, it took you know back when Google announced, it was funny because AT&T took only hours before they announced their intent to do the same thing if they could get the same types of local regulatory incentives. Seems like they have done that and now are launching in December, like you said. Um, I think that the Google still could have the upper hand because if we look at how they've done it in other markets, um, they still price pretty aggressively. So if AT&T, you know, they, they're on the hook for all these capital investments to improve their infrastructure, yet they might not have any pricing power. You mentioned pricing. Has AT&T released any information on what their pricing will be? They haven't, and actually neither has Google. So both of these two you know, fiber optic networks, uh, the pricing is not yet available. Google, but if Google, we at least know that Google's probably going to come in pretty low given where they, you know, how they price in Kansas City. And you know, AT&T has not detailed pricing, but again, that's going to be their big thing is that they probably can't price very high. And if they have to price low and they just spend all this money, they end up being the net loser when Google's coming in and Google hasn't really, ha doesn't have much to lose in that sense. How does Verizon Fios fit into this picture? So Verizon actually released a new service tier for its fiber optic network in other markets, uh, up to about 500 megabits per second, which is half the speed of Google Fiber, but they're also charging about four times the cost of Google Fiber. So Verizon really shows that they're not too concerned, uh, but at the same time... Do you Ver think that's anti-competitive, though? Well, I think that they're, you know, in the markets that Verizon was doing that in, it was pretty on par with Comcast, who is its chief competitor in those areas for fiber optics. Uh, and that's where that's really where it comes in because Google Fiber isn't in those markets to undercut. So Verizon really doesn't have to worry about them quite yet in some of these areas. And Verizon has stopped building out its Fios network. So uh, they're not really worried quite yet. But if fiber comes to one of their towns, then they might have something to worry about as far as their pricing goes. All right, let's move on to who's winning in wireless. 
Earlier this week, Kantar World Panel said that T-Mobile has hit its highest smartphone market share in the U.S. over the past year at 13 percent. That reversed a downward trend. Is T-Mobile successfully shaking up the carrier business with its uncarrier plans? You know, I've been kind of skeptical about the whole uncarrier strategy up until now because I, I didn't think it was that big of a change. But at the same time, they are really showing that, that, that consumers uh, like what they're doing. Uh, being more transparent with the pricing is clearly resonating, even though the net monthly bill may not be too different from what people were paying before. I think there's something to said about knowing what you're paying for, which isn't exactly true in the subsidy model. So they, they've definitely made some gains. They're getting a lot of momentum. Uh, CEO John Legere, is, he's very flashy. He likes to mm -hmm. get attention, and he's good at it with his bright pink shirts and his use of expletives. <laughs> but I think they definitely have are, are really shaking things up. Other than the Young Carrier Plan, can you think of anything else that could be helping T-Mobile's boost? Uh, so the Young Carrier Plan was announced at the same time that they, that they became an iPhone carrier. So you know, Apple's presence on a, within a carrier's lineup has always been a big boost. And they said that 29% of smartphone sales and upgrades in you know, the last quarter were iPhones. And there's going to be a lot of pent-up demand there, and especially with these more affordable pricing that they, you know, pricing plans that they have. So I think that there's definitely some upside there, and that's also driving sales. And Kantar estimated that the iPhone 5 was the most popular model on T-Mobile's network with about 17% of sales last quarter. So I think there's definitely some uh, Apple upside there. So we saw the other carriers, AT&T, Verizon, uh, Sprint, follow T-Mobile when T-Mobile announced its jump plan, the early upgrade plan. Do you see the other carriers maybe adopting some of the aspects of the uncarrier plan as well? They've been trying to, uh, but at the same time, they, they really don't want to disrupt what they already have going for them because the subsidy model is very successful for them. They've been using it for you know over 10 years. But at the same time, they have to adapt to consumer preferences if consumer preferences change. I mean, right now, people very much like getting a $700 phone for 200 bucks and signing a two-year contract. That's just what people like. Now, if that shifts, then AT&T and Verizon, as the big you know, post-pay carriers, they will have to adapt. And they're kind of preparing. What they're doing shows that they're preparing for that, mm -hmm. but I don't think they want that. So t is kind of a disruptor. Do you like it the most out of all the carriers? I think that they have potentially the most upside from current levels, in part because they're coming from such a weaker position, and with them gaining momentum, there's some more implied upside there if they can kind of continue what they're doing. Also, with their you know, network, they've been a little bit behind with their network rollout. Their LTE coverage lags a lot, but they've also just recently got a bunch of spectrum from AT&T and the Metro PCS merger, and now that's, that's also contiguous spectrum that's very useful. So as they build out that network, that could also further you know, reinforce that momentum, get more subscriber additions, got the iPhone now. They have a lot going for them right now. Let's move on to the rumor mill. Is the Retina iPad Mini delayed or not? There have been a lot of conflicting reports on the Retina iPad Mini. What's the latest development on this front, Evan? So over the past few months, there's been a lot of lot of debate, um, a lot of you know speculative rumors. Some say that it's going to be delayed. Digitime said it's delayed. Then you know I forget who LG said that they're still on track, which is one of the suppliers. Uh, the most recent thing is that Reuters came out th just this morning with a report saying that it will launch this year, conflicting a, a report from a couple days ago that said it was delayed. But Reuters says it will launch this year, but supply is going to be very, very limited because uh, Apple's display panel suppliers are having trouble ramping up these high-resolution re displays. I believe Apple also has much stricter requirements in terms of power consumption and some of these other quality standards that Apple you know, wants to maintain. But a full production isn't may, might not be scheduled till 2014. But I think they need you know there's a delicate balance because they want to get it out soon. But if they don't have enough, then you face these supply constraints, which are also kind of negative. But it looks like it might be set for a launch this year, but it might not be a lot to go around. The, how key is the iPad Mini for Apple? How key is the refresh, giving the competition a small tablet space in the upcoming holiday season? How? important is it for Apple to get it out now? I think it is pretty important. Um, whether or not how, how much they can supply is going to be the big question here, but I think it's important that they do it as soon as they can because Google's Nexus 7 and the new Kindle Fires that were just announced, those have really high resolution displays. So I think the Retina display on the iPad mini is a priority because I don't know how well that low resolution panel will look in late 2013, in the holiday shopping season when consumers are out trying to buy gifts. But at the same time, they could also rely on other features to kind of sell the device, including, you know, like Touch ID, that's a pretty big feature this year. 
you know, people like to make fun of the whole gold thing, but I think they're doing it in gold, and that seems to be popular right now. Um, but they, they have, you know, of course, they have their ecosystem strength. So they have other things they can fall back on beyond this purely spec war. But that being said, I think it is still important. All right, and our next rumor. Intel is delaying its internet TV launch. Intel has been hoping to beat the other tech giants to the living room and announced its plans to launch a subscription internet TV service. The service is reportedly going to be called OnQ, but it's being delayed until 2014. Evan, should Intel investors be worried? Well, I don't think the, the TV initiative has been a huge, you know, is going to be a huge deal for investors. It's, it's certainly like a side project, a little hobby that they want to get going. And Intel doesn't really have a lot of success with selling products or services directly to consumers. You know, certainly most of their business is selling to PC manufacturers and data centers and you know, direct to consumer has never been one of their strengths. And also, you know, Intel and TV have also never really been together. So I don't think this has been like a big storyline that investors have been hoping for. It's maybe an incremental gain if they can pull it off, but it's not something that people are, are really bet betting, betting on too heavily. Well, if people aren't expecting this from Intel, why is Intel doing it? Why not stick to their bread and butter? That's a good question, too, because I, everyone's been wondering, why does Intel care so much about a TV thing when they're a chip manufacturer? And you know, presumably the, the idea is to get your chips out there and really grow your presence in the living room, uh, which has been an important battleground for all the tech giants. Everyone wants to get in the living room, which is right now seen as kind of the holy grail uh, among these big heavyweights that are you know, trying to compete on the platform. Which level. heavyweights? You know, Apple, Microsoft, Google, they're all really trying to grow their presence in the living room, in part because it's not only is it kind of ripe for disruption, but if you think about the TV from a hardware perspective, that's it has a very long upgrade cycle. So that's going to sit in your living room for maybe five to seven years compared to a smartphone that you switch every two years. So these companies want to get in there on a big device that everyone shares. So that, that has the ability to anchor uh, consumers to the platform potentially uh, on the hardware front, which is probably where Apple will go if they end up doing this TV set that everyone's been talking about. Yeah, I have a question about that. So you're, you're mentioning they want to anchor everyone to one device, but right now, X, Microsoft has the Xbox, which is a console. Google TV, ha Google has the Chromecast and other Google products. Um, and then there's Apple TV, which is also a box. There's no integrated smart TV. Who's going to do that first? There are a few integrated smart TVs, but none, none from those the big and, players. Right. And we have like Samsung, Samsung. And, and some of the other OEMs doing, but they're really not. They're, there's still a lot of work to be done in terms of the interface and real like a deeper level of integration with the platforms. Uh, and at, Xbox is a pretty you know big business for Microsoft, and they have a very large installed base, and that is in a way cross-platform in the sense that it works with any TV. So they, and it's a little bit of a lower entry price too, as opposed to if Apple does a full TV, it might be two thousand dollars. But I Which think is my five hundred dollar Xbox. Right, yeah. and I think Microsoft has a head start here definitely because it has a very large. Uh, brand recognition with the Xbox. Uh, Chromecast coming at the low end of the market, $35 little thing you, you plug in. Uh, has some potential right now, it's too early to call, but they're starting to gather content partners. I believe Hulu Plus just announced um, they're, get your, they're supporting Chromecast now. A lot of competition here, and Intel wants to get in on it, but at the same time, I don't think they're going to have a good chance against the other guys that have more of a consumer brand. It's a crowded field. All right. For Avenue, I'm Erin Kennedy, and we'll see you next time.